All right. Um, so today we're going to um, continue on the uh, Bayesian linear regression. At first, I thought, okay, maybe we can even go further to the multiple linear regression, but I figured, okay, let's not be too um, ambitious here. I think I have stuff, like added a few more material to the slides. So um, today we're going to cover the rest of the inference that we didn't get to do for the simple linear regression, the example that I did. And also added a few more material, a few more slides about different ways to give priors for those regression coefficients um, in this kind of model, which I think will be useful to cover. So the plan is I will cover some of those and then um, the rest, which is um, actually implementing the uh, different type of prior, one type of prior, in fact, will be left as a lab question, short lab for you to do. Okay, so let me. Um, Start with, okay, so last time, if you remember, we were here. I think um, I show you, say, um, like, say, remember, we run the JAX code first with the model, and then we realized the first one was um, too sticky for the parameters beta 0 and beta 1. So then we decided to do more thinning, and then once we did that, so sigma was fine previously and now it's fine as well. So that's where we came to uh, this output um, summary. Remember, so now um, the effective sample size, they're greater than 500, which are usually sufficient. But of course, you can still see that beta 0 and beta 1 has um, stickiness and high, co or like relatively high autocorrelation here. But we summarize the results based on based on this output. And in terms of interpretation of the beta zero, which is the intercept, as well as the beta one, which is the slope, um, typically, especially if you look at the plot, well, I mean, for sigma and uh, beta one and beta zero, I mean, both of them are sort of symmetric in terms of the histogram down there. Um, but typically, you can summarize, say, like a typical variable, or like a typical value will be the median. So that's why in the interpretation, I was using uh, the value of median when when we describe what it means to have the intercept as well as uh, for the slope. And in particular, you see that you have to be very specific about the unit change in what variable. In particular, for our case, it's in the, on the log scale. Some of you might just want to work it back to the original scale, that's fine as well. I was, I guess, being lazy, just work on the log scale. And uh, the interval, both of the intervals here, they come from the 90% uh, posterior probability, I mean, interval that's from the lower 95 and then the upper 95 from the output. So that's what we, I think, had last time. So um, you can do more uh, different inferences um, based on the output. So I'm gonna cover three different types. Uh, one is similarly fits from the regression model. So that, as you will see that, especially in the Bayesian framework, you will see that our output, based on what we have after the new round, we have 5,000 draws for the beta zero, for the beta one, and for the sigma, right? They, they each, I mean, each is a triplet. They come as uh, like, a, like a group of three, and then you have 5,000 draws for each of the set. So what you can do for the similarly fits from the regression model is you can look at um, like the fittings of those from the draws that you have. And in fact, we have 5,000 of them. Plotting all of them will be too much. So we're going to do some demo as how you can simulate those fits, maybe like 10 of them. And next, you can actually um, also learn more about the expected response, which is the mu i. Okay, so that, again, comes from the fact that we put a linear model which express the linear re linear relationship between mu i, which is the mean, as well as the um, response, uh, sorry, as well as the predictor, which is the x i. Right. So that is one thing. And lastly, we're going to look at some prediction of future responses. So that actually goes back to what we covered at the beginning part of the semester: how you can use multi causal simulation to do a step by step. Okay, so this is doing prediction, meaning that I need to get the means first. Right, the means are coming from the mu i equals to beta zero plus beta one times x i. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we know that the data, which is y i, follows a normal distribution with that mean and then sigma. Right, so you actually will have to take one more uh, simulated draw from the normal distribution from there. Right? So we're going to look at the different 
contribution of the variability to the ultimate uh, prediction. And then I will talk about the new priors, other priors I can do. So the similar fits from the regression model. So remember uh, in equation 16, we have this expression, which originally we have mu equals to beta zero plus beta one times x, but it's the same as thinking about because we assume the mean of y is at mu, so you can also express in terms of the expectation of y. And then each pair of the values that you generate from the posterior, beta zero and beta one. So now we're not dealing with sigma. We're only looking at mean, okay? So each pair of those values correspond to one line in the entire space of values of x and y, right? You get one pair of beta zero, beta one. So that corresponds to one line. And the other, the other for us, we have 5,000 pairs in total. So in theory, you can, like, I mean, each of the pair represents or corresponds to your line. And sometimes people will just use the posterior mean, beta zero, I'm using beta zero tilde and beta zero, or beta one tilde, uh, say that, okay, this might be the best line of fit going through the data. If I summarize the posterior mean of beta zero and beta one, and then just plot that. Okay? So that, of course, ignores a lot of the uncertainty or variability across the beta zero and beta one that you'll be able to summarize. So what you can do is, um, we can plot more, but not as many as 5,000. Otherwise, I mean, if you do that, I think the whole picture is black. But uh, we're going to do a few. And what I mean here is on the right hand side, you see the plot. So the dots are still the original data point. Okay? And then the different lines, I'm plotting the first 10. And the code, the script that you can use, is on the left. And essentially, what I'm doing is uh, so, first of all, I save the posterior draws into this. Um, object of post. So I use as MCMC. So this again, um, this is, um, I think you will need to use the uh, package, the coda package, okay, the library. So load that, and then you can turn the draws into something that you'll be able to use, okay? So what I'm doing here is I save everything, the parameter draws in post, and then I'm only using the ones for beta zero and beta one, okay? We also have that one we're calling about sigma, but right now we're not using it. We're just working with the means at the moment. And uh, then you can see that here. So just to make the plot still readable, I'm using the first 10 pairs to draw. So that's why you see 10 different lines. I mean, yeah, 10 different lines over here that you can see going through the cloud of the data points. And I mean, the. 10 different lines are not totally overlapping, right? So that represents the variability or the uncertainty that you have in the parameters of beta zero and beta one. And this is just a notation of what exactly I'm doing, but like J, capital J, but here, capital J can go up to 5,000, but we're demonstrating with um, 10 of them here. And one thing you might notice that even though the 10 lines are not exactly the same, uh, their variability doesn't seem to be a lot either. Right, I mean, sometimes you will see, especially when you're working with a small sample. So this case, we have, I think, close to a thousand observations of the uh, of the C data. So, um, but then if you're working with a smaller sample, maybe some of you're going to encounter that in your your project. And uh, then in those cases, you're going to have higher uncertainty in terms of the beta and sigma as well. And that you will see like lines; those simulated line fits going to vary a lot. It's still going to go across like the cloud of the data, uh, but not as like concentrated as what we see here, right? So keep in mind that in Bayesian analysis, we assume the parameters are random, okay? That's why for the beta zero, beta one, and later sigma, you get multiple 5,000 draws in our case. And there is this variability in those, and that variability is going to carry, as you can see, if we're going to simulate the fits, you're going to see different ones. Okay. And that variability later, in the end, we're going to do the prediction. You will see that that variability comes into play in the prediction as well. Okay. But the model itself has three parameters, and all of the parameters are random. So we do take into account of the variability of those parameters when we're doing the inference. And then when you try to summarize, make inference out of the model, you should also um, accommodate, or I should say, include them. In your in your presentation in terms of the, the outcome. Okay. 
So that's uh, for simulating the fits. You can do like 10 or 20, whichever you prefer, but this is the way that you can do this. And this is only simulating the mean, okay? So that's why, um, but then again, there are variabilities, so you see different, different lines here going through it. But they're similar enough in the sense that they're still concentrated. All right, so that's one way you can make inference about. Another thing is about the expected response. So this is the case that, okay, now if I have, we know that a predictor is the log of the income, right? So if I know that, like say, um, I know one consumer unit with income something, and then I know, okay, then the predictor for that will be the log income, so I take the log of that value, and then I want to know about the expected response, which is the log expenditure of the CU, then what you can do, not surprisingly, I would say is you will fix the X, right? Fix the X, and then the X of what you are given, in this case, the log income, and then you can simulate a sample from the posterior, which is the beta zero plus beta one times X, given the X that you're working with, and that will give you the expected value of the log expenditure of that CU with a given log income. Okay. So this is just a demo, so you can see that we're again using that post object, saving all of the posterior draws, right? And now I'm not only simulating uh, 10 of them, I'm actually using all of the 5,000 pairs, right? just to get the variability, to get a sense of how variable, like say when I'm looking at the expected response, what my distribution of that will look like. And in the middle here, I create a data frame which is um, trying to set different, like four, I'm setting four different values of X, 1579. And um, well, I chose it just, uh, so again, it's on the log scale, okay? So that's why they're smaller. And also just to make the plot later look nicer, I have to like choose the values that like say, it's in the increasing order that, say for example, if I choose 10 also in there, then the plot wouldn't go as, maybe I didn't figure it out well enough, but anyway, I chose this for, just to make sure that later you see this increasing order when I show the plot as well. I will show it in a minute, but anyway, so what this is doing is we compute fix x, four different values. x equals to one, x equals to five, equals to nine, and uh, seven and nine, and then we do this um, compute, computation of the expected value of y, given those x values. And we're doing that for each pair. So we have 5,000 pairs for them. So that means just by going through, like if you think about it, we're getting five different expected values for each of the X that we have here, okay? Because how the mean is constructed, okay? And if you do that, you're gonna see plots like this, okay? So on the Y axis is in fact the X, okay? Which is the uh, fixed log income that we've Play with so it's one five six one five seven nine that I talked about the x-axis actually is talking about I mean if you think about the scale that is the expected um, log expenditure so that will be the scale for the outcome which is for the expected value of that so now you can see that what what do you think of this I should say this are looking at four different x values and I'm computing from each pair of my regression coefficients. So I have 5,000 total, so I'm able to get five sample, 5,000 samples for each of the means and then I can plot them in terms of uh, like a density plot like this, I can line them up. So, I mean, obviously the means are different, right? As you have larger, um, income, log income, which is going up there, your expected log expectation, log expenditure, gonna uh, be bigger as well on the x-axis, right? But what else do you see? I mean, I'm gonna pause here, but what else do you see uh, in this plot that's showing you the relationship about, um, say, like the, the linear, linear relationship between them, first of all? And second, I guess also, interestingly, I think the spread is quite different in terms of um, this kind of um, 
not prediction, expected response. So I would like you to think about that and talk to your neighbors, and then I will ask for for a comment. So we stopped. So somebody must want to talk. Why do you think? Like, what do you observe here? And then, why do you think? What do you think might be the reason why we see different spread in this case? Or what does it mean to have this different spread? Or what does it mean, say, when you have log income to be one, um, or comparing to that to log income to be five, what's the biggest difference that you see and why do you think, what do you think is causing that? This is like a guess, but like we thought it might have something to do with like how many samples are in each. Mm. Mm. Unfortunately, I think it's 5,000 each. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's okay. So again, yeah, to explain this a little bit more. So what this is showing is we have 5,000 pairs of beta 0 and beta 1. Right? So, yeah. And then we do, we, we use each pair to compute the expectation of y given x. So this is different x values, one, five, seven, nine. And each, yeah, so that means each of the plot here is representing a density plot of 5,000 means. Yeah, so it's the same number of uh, samples here, which, yeah, um, probably doesn't help to explain why, why their variability uh, in terms of the sample size, because it's different. Any other guess, Christian? Um, so the fact that the, the central tendencies are different are, is pretty obvious, right, for all the plots, because that for, for different incomes, you have different expenditures. So the higher your income, your higher expenditure, which is kind of explaining the trend. Um, which think, is, I guess, translated from the values of beta, yeah. right? Uh, beta 1, yeah. I should say. Beta which is one. beta 1 multiplies with x. Mm -hmm. And I think beta 1 is positive. Let me just double check. I think it was. Uh, right. Yeah, it's probably helpful to come back to this really quick as well. Beta 1, strictly positive. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is the plot. Yeah, I think this plot, you can see that it's strictly positive because the histogram come, starts from point oh, I mean point three five ish right? So it's always positive beta 1, and that multiplies with x. Right, so we have that's not surprising. I'm saying this um, to confirm what um, Kushan was saying here, um, because beta one is positive. So if you have larger log income, which is the x, when you increase x, the expected value of the log expenditure is going to increase as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you want to continue? Um, I'm not, I'm not super sure about the, the spread. So all of these are from the same model, like they're from like the same set of data. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not super sure about the spread. Mm -hmm. So the relationship between the expectation of y, which is what's brought, uh, plotted here, and um, the x is it's beta 0 plus beta 1 times x, right? So I'm guessing, I should have checked, but I'm guessing looking at this that you're going to start to have smaller spread when your x increases. I'm guessing because that's what's changing is the um, x values being multiplied with the beta 1. Right? So beta 1 has variability, which is captured in the summary that we saw, right? Beta 0 as well. So I'm guessing the variability of beta 1 is smaller than that of the beta 0.
because as your x increases, you start to see smaller variability. Anyway, so I should have checked it earlier, so I'm hoping I'm not like saying wrong things, but let's go back to this summary here really quick, which is, right, look at the standard deviation here. It's a linear relationship between the expectation of y and then the x, right? So we have 5,000 draws, 5,000 pairs, so beta zero has bigger variability, which as you can see, the standard deviation is 0.2, whereas the standard deviation for beta one is ten, one tenth of that, right? So does that make sense to you? If it's smaller, then when you go, go to this plot that we see here, Yeah, but all of these rely on beta 1, right? Yeah, all of them, you're right, you're right, yeah. So it's the effect of the variability of beta 1. How does that play out in terms of, in terms of when you increase the value of x, how that affects the, because beta zeros are all the same. Right. Because it's beta 0 plus beta 1 times x, right? So what's being different, what's controlling the spread here, obviously, I think comes from the beta 1. Is beta 0 also like a smaller value like in magnitude? Yeah, let's check that. So, in fact, no. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you see that. Yeah, so, which also makes sense in a sense that because beta 0 is at a bigger magnitude, so it's overall like affecting the mean. Mm -hmm. More, yeah. right? right? And beta 1 is smaller over, I mean, it's one tenth of all of this pretty much. Like if you look at the lower 95, median, and upper 95, and also the standard deviation. So that might be uh, what it is. And um, yeah. In fact, I didn't think about this before we started. So, so, so I think, yeah. Is it possible that it's just because it's the log since like, a log moves like this, so as you get larger value, like if you think of like log of x, if mm -hmm. there's like a small change in x when x is very large, there's not much of a change in log of x, right. but then when x is really small and you change it a little, then the log would change a lot. Right, but I thought we're working with log every, everywhere. Yeah, Everything is log. Because like both are log. Yeah, like we log the data in the first place. Okay. Yeah, but, but good, good point. Okay. Um, one other thing I can think of, which I don't know, maybe it's wrong, but what I can think of is, um, if you look at this, I mean the density, I mean not exactly like normal, but, but similar in some sense, right? So in fact, I think, um, well maybe not exactly in the way that we set it up in this way, but I think the univariate posterior for each of those, um, sorry, I should say, the univariate posterior for the beta zero and beta one, they're also approximately normal. I think, yeah. So what this is doing is essentially, if you think about it, so last time I talked about this really quick, uh, but I never thought about it in this context yet, but if you remember last time, I was saying, well, if you have uh, x, which follows a normal mu one and sigma one, right? And then y, which is mu two, sigma two, so last time I was saying if these two are independent from probability theory, we know that the sum of x and y is going to follow mu1 plus mu2, right? And then the standard deviation is this if they're independent. Okay? Yeah. So this, I think... Um, so then, so this was from last time, and then now I'm saying that beta zero and beta one, beta one I think the posterior is also approximately normal, so let's say, uh, let's say, I'm just saying, I don't know, maybe this is not the reason why we see the decrease of the spread, but let's say posterior, okay, let's say posterior of this two, okay? 
So essentially what these plots are doing, oh my God. Um, should sigma two uh, in that variance is greater than sigma one squared plus yes. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Good catch. Uh, okay. So um, okay. So then what these plots are doing is we're computing beta zero plus beta one times x, right? Each x is fixed. So it's known. And then if beta zero follows a normal distribution and beta one follows a normal distribution, this is a linear combination of these two. So what this is doing, if this is true, like approximately if this is true, then we know what this is going to follow. This is going to follow a normal distribution with mean m1, that's the mean of beta zero, right, plus m2 times x, okay, and the variance this is probably not helpful, anyway, let me just finish this, so it's going to be sigma 1 squared plus, so this is the case that we have a constant multiplying in front of this random variable, so if you recognize there's a constant, it's going to be x squared times s2 squared. But as soon as I wrote it, I realized it's not helpful because this is x squared and x is increasing. So this should, never mind. I will go back and figure it out. But I thought, okay, never mind. But I think it's important to recognize that we do see the decrease of the spread. And I thought there must be some a reason behind it, but I don't know for now. Yeah. What I was trying to do is, okay, what if what if we know that like beta zero and beta one, their posterior both proximal normal, and then we assume they're independent, right? So then by doing the probability theory, we can show what is the distribution roughly, the distribution of beta zero plus beta one times x. So then that will be this if I did it right. So it's the mean, the sum of the mean, okay? And then the standard deviation will be the sum of the standard deviation, except now for beta 1, we multiply with x, which is considered as constant because it's known. And if we look at this, then obviously with larger x, this is going to be larger. I don't know. So I'll figure out and let you know next time. But it's important to recognize it's, um, it's pretty obvious, I think the change of the spread in here. And um, yeah, I will get back to you next time. But anyway, so this is the way that you can um, compute and then also visualize how the um, expected response when you're looking at different x values and you can put them together. The only issue earlier I was saying that, well, I was hoping because log 9 is actually like when you do uh, get it back to the original scale, it's not very really large. The thing is, I think uh, how it's plotting is uh, when you have 1, and if I have a 10, then that 10 will just come here before 5. So it just doesn't look as good, like looking at the trend going on. But maybe I just didn't figure out the package well enough. But, but that's why I'm doing 1579 uh, for now, just to demo how, how it works. Okay? But you can choose whichever um, the x value that you're curious about when you're doing this computation. Okay. All right, so this is how to learn about expected uh, response. And then you can also, in fact, uh, produce um, the uh, percentile. So this is just looking at the quant I mean, the 0.05, I mean, 5%, the median, and 95%. And this also, you will be able to make a statement about the posterior median as well as the uh, credible interval of certain coverage for the mean value for a given x. Okay, so this is um, the case I'm giving here is looking at uh, case number two, that if we know uh, CU of the log income is $5, then the posterior median of the expected log expenditure is 6.42, and uh, a 90% credible interval for the log expe expected log expenditure is between 4.24 to Sorry, 6.24 to 6.61. Okay. Keep in mind right now, if you look at the mean, the range is not that big in terms of, say, 
uh, log income equals to five, right? So this, the 90% credible interval goes from 6.24 to 6.61. We're gonna come back to this pair uh, in a minute, especially when we start doing the um, prediction. So here, when we're looking at the um, expected response, we only are working with this, right? So any kind of variability that comes into play is because of beta zero and beta one, right? And when now we move to do prediction, and we know that prediction should not only cover the variability from the beta zero and beta one, but also the sigma. Because if like doing Monte Carlo approximation, we know if I want to generate a new yi, I will get the set of beta zero, beta one, and sigma, right? I first of all get the mean, and then I take a random draw from the normal in order to make a new prediction. So it's not surprising later soon that you will see that if I, instead of, so here we're looking at the expected log expenditure, because we're only working with this, and you see like a 90% credible interval in this way, now we're going to do prediction, and then if you do, like say, looking at the median as well as the 90% um, credible interval for the predicted value, because of the extra ex, uh, extra variability, because of how the model is set up and also the draws that you have, you're going to have a wider interval for the predicted value. Okay? And that is because, like what I show here, that when you do prediction, you do take all of this into account. Whereas when you're looking, only looking at the expected response, you only have the variability coming from beta zero and beta one. So I think these are important um, observations. And then this again tells us how variability comes into play in the whole model. And then in terms of computing expected value and then from there getting the predictive value, you will start to see their relationship and how things play out. So the next and the last um, inference stuff that we do is this prediction. So I've been talking about this already. So pretty much because this is how the data model is set up. And then if we were right now to do prediction, what we do is we get it step by step. So for a large number of S, which is the number of simulations you can do, pretty much you can, in our case, because you already had five, and draws of beta zero, beta one, and sigma, so you can just pick S to be 5,000, so you're simulating um, new predictions from there, and what you do is for each of the X, as you can see, you can get 5,000 different predicted values, okay? And the step is very similar, if you realize what we have seen before of um, doing Back then, it's more about posterior predictive, but it's the same idea, okay? You get, you go back to the model, which is, I mean, the data model, which is equation 19 in our case, and that's the final step that you do when you do prediction, right? But before that, you need to get the posterior draws, okay? In the past, yeah, in the past, I think, we're doing Monte Carlo approximation, especially before we're using JEX, because we already know the analytic solution of those posterior. So what we do is we generate one draw from its posterior distribution, right? Like say for the Poisson gamma, for that lambda parameter, we get lambda draw, one draw of lambda from its posterior gamma. And then from there, we take a new draw from the Poisson, so we get the predicted value, right? Here, because Jax already produced all of the draws for you, so we didn't do the first step. But in order to do prediction, you still have to do the next or last or second step here, which is on the right column, okay? And, make sense? How you do predictions, okay, and how the link it is to, to what we have seen before. All right, so here's some code that you can do it, and you see that I'm doing 5,000 uh, for each of the X values. And of course, we cannot plot all of the X values, so I keep uh, consistent, I'm using X equals to 1579 again. And then these are the plots. So when you're looking at prediction-wise, I think the variability is not that extreme as what we see before. 
right? Earlier, when we were only looking at the mean, well, now we still don't know why that is the case. I will try to figure out and let you know next time. Um, but here, this is um, at different values of log income 1579. You can see 5,000, the density plot of the 5,000 predicted values at each of those. Okay. And this, I think, again, this time the variability not only comes from beta 0 and beta 1, but also sigma. And I think that obviously sigma is dominating here if you think about the spread. And because now they're all like comparable in some sense. Okay, so I think sigma is uh, dominating here. Uh, but still, previously why we saw that, um, I don't know yet, but I'll let you know. And you can also do this uh, posterior summary. So I'm looking at when you have log income to be five. So this is what I mean earlier, I think for the mean case, the, maybe I wrote it here. Oh yeah, I wrote it here. So previously, for, okay, this is what we see now. If you're doing prediction, this is what the 90% credible interval, right? Looking at the table that we have, which is when you have the uh, log income to be five, you have 95%, 90 percent probability of having your predicted log expenditure to be between 5.22 to 7.61, right? That's this is what it is about. But then previously, when you are not doing prediction but only looking at the expected log income, a log expenditure, then that was the range, which is 6.24 to 6.61. So that was what I was calling your attention to earlier. But this, again, together with the plots that we saw just now, like stack up together, looking at the different uh, density plot of 5,000 predictive values, that it's telling us, well, now, because the predictive distribution already starts to incorporate sizable uncertainty in sigma, okay, and that dominates how you see the variability in terms of the prediction, okay? But um, anyway, I think it's important to to realize and recognize the phenomenon, and hopefully that can uh, enhance your understanding a little bit more about, say, how the variability really comes into the model, and how Bayesian methods is estimating those probability, and then how that can be actually uh, expressed in terms of doing various inferences, including doing prediction, as well as doing, um, like looking at the, the mean values of a given x when you're just simulating from from the beta zero and beta one. Okay. All right, so I think that's, uh, okay.